네 반갑습니다 다들. 그다음 해도 안 된대요. 정 강주 선생님 아예 다시 뵙는 것 같습니다. 이영우 선생님 안녕하세요. 어서 오십시오 반갑습니다. 이영우 선생 이영우 선생 강창 선생님은 처음 뵙는 것 같네요. 양동수입니다 이영우 선생님 안녕하세요. 네, 서, 아직 행사 전이니까 서로 편안하게 인사 나누시면 좋겠습니다. 어서 네. 들어오세요. 안녕하세요. 네, 어서 오이소. 워싱턴 주명 선생님 반갑습니다. 네. 안녕하세요. 아마 비소 있어 티카만 미시 사이트 소망은? 우로 올라가 있어서 이 그림들을 밑으로 하면 안 되나? 아마 라스게 리바죠. 이래 두는 게 낫지. 장마해가 또못 들어갈라 또. 강효재 교수님은 얼굴 아주 막 옛날이나 그 한국 가서 비행기 타고 피곤할 텐데 얼굴 아주 막 탱생하시네요. 옛날 피곤한 적이나 하나도 안 보여요. 네, 한국은 어떻습니까? 강호재 박사님. 코로나 때 그... 모르겠습니다. <웃음> <웃음> 집에 갇혀 있어서 아직 모르겠습니다. 나 돌아다니지 어. 못했습니다. 네. 아 우리 회장님 어. 들어오셨네요. 반갑습니다. 아, 안녕하세요. 김성훈 회장님 안녕하세요. 네, 제가 몇 분들 핀을 해드리겠습니다. 아 시애틀에 계시네요. 네. 시바술 자모님헬싱키어때예그살살기좀좋아예헬싱키그러면항상눈눈많이오고숲이고네눈다녹았어요이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이
네, 선생님, 저, 어, 이제 1분 정도 남았습니다. 저희가 1분 지금 2시 정확하게 되었는데요. 지금부터 제가 구글 슬라이드를 이제 공유를 하도록 하겠습니다. 강우재 박사님 그리고 네. 시애틀 협의 모두 반갑습니다. 최광천입니다. 운영위원입니다. 안녕하세요. 네, 지금 2시라서 다 뮤트를 Hello everyone. Would you please mute yourself because we are going to start. 아, 지금부터 안녕하세요. 북한 북해. Hello everyone. 바로 알기. 사회 연구. Now we will start the second lecture of the series of knowing North Korea, North Korean nuclear program and North Korean economy correctly. Hello everyone again. My name is Ji Kasil, chairperson of the Youth Committee in Seattle. I would like to thank everyone who participates in this webinar. Would you please rename yourself with English name and your region? And if you want English translation, you can choose your language. We are providing simultaneous interpretation. And we also operate a telegram study group. So now we will start the second lecture. Bukan Buka. For the second lecture, we will discuss the present status of defense science and technology of DPRK. The order of the event is that we will first have the salute to the national flag, and we will hear um, welcoming remarks and then hear the lecture from Dr. Hoje Kang. Now, we will do the... 먼저 국기에 대한 격례를 하겠습니다. 모니터에 나오는 태극기를 향하여 격례해 주시기 바랍니다. Salute to the flag. Please salute to the national flag. 국기에 대하여 경례. 나는 자랑스러운 태극기 앞에 자유롭고 정의로운 대한민국의 무궁한 영광을 위하여 충성을 다할 것을 굳게 다짐합니다. 바로 다음은 애국가를 제청하겠습니다. Next, we will sing together the national anthem. 
나라를 위해 희생하신 모든 분들을 기억하고 추모하는 시간을 갖겠습니다. Now, now we will pay tribute to those who sacrificed themselves for the country in silence. Sorry for the technical mistakes. Again, sorry for the technical mistakes. Uh, now, next we will hear welcoming remarks from Chairperson Kim Sung-hun. Hello, it's yours now. Hello, everyone. My name is Kim Sung-hun, Chairperson of the Seattle Chapter of New York. I would like to welcome everyone who joined this second lecture. As we already explained, today we are going to learn more about present status of defense science and technology of DPRK because we are providing this webinar virtually. It also um, enables everyone across the world to join this webinar. I'm sorry that I cannot mention everyone who is contributing to this lecture, but I have a great expectations for this webinar. And I hope this will contribute to the peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula. And I hope everyone can learn something from this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Kang. Thank you for your remarks. He provided full support in preparing this webinar. And I would like to also thank the Secretary General of the Seattle chapter. Now the floor is yours, Dr. Gang. 반갑습니다. Hello, everyone. My name is Ho Jae Kang. I'm so happy to see so many of you attending this lecture. Today, we will go even deeper into this subject. Maybe it would be more difficult to science technology terms. But I would guide you through this difficult subject, and I also expect um, active discussion after my lecture. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, last lecture, I provided some overview of North Korea's nuclear status, how we can understand the correct status of North Korea's nuclear programs. And I also 
explained the secret of 2008. I, th I think that was the last chance that we lost to solve these nuclear, nuclear issues. I hope the Biden administration um, does not remain at the um, status quo because South Korea kept saying that we don't want a world, we want peaceful unification. And I think that, pro that prevented the United States from um, taking more hostile policy toward the North Korea. For this second lecture, I'm going to um, go deeper in the, in the subject. I think most of them are familiar with this issue. And I think I know many of the participants today. But for those people who don't know me, I'm going to reintroduce myself because I think because I think it is very important for you to um, have confidence in my lecture to show that I have academic background in science and history. So I think I am at least um, capable of knowing the truth and force. So, so I would like to just say that you can trust what I am, what I have to say about this scientific aspect of this issue. From, because not all individuals can have a professional knowledge or research capability in this issue. So it is, it would be enough to have a few correct information. And I think I am one of the very few scholars majoring in scientific history of North Korea. I was the first doctor in this major, and there is one another person who majored in this subject, and no more people are studying this issue. Contents that I have to provide are not familiar with many of you because these issues are not widely discussed among the public. And I had difficulties in finding job in South Korea, and that's why I had to move to Germany. I think I am the only one who researches only North Korean issues and teaches only North Korean issues. And so, majoring in North Korea and teaching North Korean subject is very few right now. But the Free Institute, Free University of Berlin is very active in providing this program uh, studying North Korea. And I wrote this book as my doctoral thesis. I wrote uh, my thesis about the uh, um, formation history of North Korea's science and technology. With my um, lecturer's position at the Free University of Berlin, I am planning to complete the full series of this book. 
And I also published one essay collection book about understanding North Korea through its science and technology. Uh, this book is no more available in the market. But if there are enough interest in this book, maybe I can republish it later. And you can see the contents of the book. And most of these contents you can find from my blog. So the reason why I uh, show this same content again and again is because it is very important to, to prepare our future together. Science, technology, and future are very common across the world, but the connection between science and technology and future is directly connected to the unification issue in the Korean Peninsula. And if you see this picture, you see that the four pillars are um, correlated, but then um, there is a gap between scientific technology and North Korea. So I think it is a bit important to, to connect to these dots. And I think that is my life mission. It doesn't give me enough like money, but I think that's my life mission. Just because there are not many people who do this kind of work. And that is why I am trying to provide as many public lectures as possible so that we can tightly connect the four pillars to realize peaceful unification on the Korean Peninsula. The, the contents of today's lecture is first, we will see the history of nuclear. And next, we will see how, how, how to mislead or fraud the people in the nuclear information. I understand that there are many people who are so frustrated by this um, misinformation. So I want to help those people gain correct understanding of this issue. And for missiles, uh, I will go deeper because it was not discussed in the last lecture. The history of missiles is history of mechanics and, mis and machines. It also, uh, missile technology has also duality it can be used for civilian use and also for military use. So it depends upon us how to use this technology. You can kill people with this technology, but you can also save people with the same technology. Uh, North Korea, publicized it as a technology by launching a satellite and conducting missile tests. This timeline of space vehicle missile test launching is very important because whenever there, whenever there was a new missile test conducted, there were opportunities to have negotiations. I use the term uh, demonstration or presentation because that is the intention of North Korea to demonstrate how advanced its technology is. And 
Of course, there are mechanisms and devices to deceive the public. Unfortunately, since 2015, North Korea revealed a lot of information about its missile technology to public. So because there was a lot of information available, so it was more difficult to deceive the public. And right now, there is no more people who deny that North Korea has the capability of launching its missiles to a high range. So I'm going to discuss more about its missile technology. And in order to prevent ourselves from um, disguised, disguised with this misinformation, we have to understand the logics of, like, for example, the general paradox, illusion, and tunnel vision. There is a saying that in order to win over your fight, you have to get closer to your enemy. The closer to your enemy, you can win over. It is the same with North Korean issue. With the sanctions and with further isolation of North Korea, you become even far from solving the problems. So by closing the gap between the parties, you can prevent war crisis. And what's the reason why we cannot be close together with North Korea? Underlying this misconcept is that only a few countries can have nuclear power. Now China has nuclear power and the United States has nuclear power and North Korea has nuclear power. But I think it is possible to have a friendship with North Korea even after recognizing its nuclear power. There are other scholars who agree with this allegations. Like for example, um, Dr. Hacker from the United States say that it's, it makes no sense to um, fight North Korea with nuclear just because North Korea has nuclear capability. Um, now I see the brief history of a nuclear program in North Korea. During the Japanese colonial ruling, Japan um, hindered Korean people from learning scientific technologies. However, strangely enough, but in physics, there, uh, there were a lot of theoretical physics study conducted because for theory, you can study with only pencils and papers. You don't need any um, sophisticated laboratory facilities to study theoretical physics. And those people who studied the theoretical physics, many of them actually um, crossed border to North Korea. A representative figure is Dr. Sang Nok Do. He made a great achievement in science. And his children 
were also scientists. So, the Dr. Do Sang Lo, he is the founding father of North Korea's nuclear program. He graduated from Gyeongsang University Physics Department, and due to the um, restrictions by the, the United States military regime, he, he fled to North Korea, and he led the initial nuclear program development in North Korea. Later, Mr. So sang who graduated from university in early 1960, he studied abroad in the Soviet Union. According to some stories about him, the Soviet Union wanted to keep him in the Soviet Union because he, the, the Soviet Union did not want to losing him. However, he returned to North Korea and he talked to the Chinese after coming back from the Soviet Union because he wanted to um, live in hide. And then later, other people found out he was hiding himself um, in a country. He was again um, revealed into the, the area of North Korea's nuclear program. However, however I could not find um, any further information about his later days. And then from 1955 to 1956, there was a nuclear physics lab created inside the Physics and Math Research Institute at the Science Academy. And in 1956, there was a joint institute of nuclear technology created by the Soviet Union. North Korea was one of the founding members. With the support from this joint institute, in 1959, North Korea um, made an experimental reactor and it also created Metatron. So the very initial prototype model of reactors were first created in 1959. Regarding duality of nuclear, it means it can be used also for civilian use and military use. No one can stop peaceful use of nuclear materials. However, for military use, International treaty can stop the usage, but for peaceful use, no one can stop it. You understand why people cannot live in the Fukushima area, even many years have passed since the explosion. It is because of this radioactive isotope. There are three types of 
radioactive isotopes and you see this graph the explosion or rejection of radioactive isotope follows the um, fixed interval so that's why you can see how old this material is by reviewing the amount of its um, initial initial time and the final status. This radiation can also use for peaceful uses, such as like medical treatment. It can, it can cure cancers, and it can also modify um, plants and animals. Radiation can penetrate this like a microwave can penetrate even lead which is the hardest to penetrate and the most dangerous radiate radioactive isotope is gamma ray and if you are exposed to gamma ray um, it can be destroyed very quickly. Even a robot can be destroyed in a short period of time. And you have to remember this theory that E equals MC square. It means that um, mass equals energy. There was a very um, huge discovery. So, Basic understanding, basic principle of this um, energy generation is that by reducing the mass, you can transform that energy into heat. And the same technology can be used for um, weapons. If you make this um, reaction, very rapid, then if it reacts rapidly enough to create a massive explosion, then it can be used as a weapon. And there is another kind of um, nuclear bomb as EMP bomb, which has no radiation fallout. It's just like a microwave you use. I wonder if any of you put, put a, a, a hole in a microwave, and if you turn on the microwave, you will see the spark coming from this um, microwave. Fresh. And so it means that if you turn on a huge microwave in the air, then it will destroy, like it will um, break down, burn down all electric devices. That's the principle of EMP bomb. I think EMP bomb is one of the most useful nuclear bombs because it doesn't have a radiation fallout. So radiation materials will disperse in the atmosphere and only the energy you can use. And these days, North Korea is talking about strategical weapons. Well, there is no clear distinction between strategical weapons and tactical weapons. It, um, there is only one difference. 
the power of um, destruction. So when it comes to tactical weapons, it means that like, you are miniaturizing the weapons with a smaller impact, but still it is nuclear bomb. And North Korea keeps saying that it is not going to use any nuclear bombs on the Korean Peninsula because it is the land where we have to live for generations. Then where to use these nuclear bombs? When a foreign army attacks North Korea. So there are different types of nuclear bombs. For nuclear fission, it means that like when you break down a material, then it reduces the mass and it creates huge energy. You have to reach critical mass in order to have this breakdown. You have to go beyond critical mass to have this explosive power. It means lower than the critical mass, you would not have this explosive reaction from nuclear materials. So that's why you make silos between the materials. That's how you can control the explosive speed. And if you go beyond this critical mass, you can have a bomb. Um, for centrifuge, you can concentrate or enrich uranium by using centrifuges. And reactors are used to create a plutonium because you cannot gain plutonium naturally, but you have to burn uranium to have a plutonium. So if you hear something about, about centrifuges, you can say that it's all about uranium bomb. And if you hear a reactor, then it refers to a plutonium bomb. So from this picture, you can see that there is is uranium, it shows that like a 23592, that refers to the, um, the mass. So it means like a bigger number, you can see, you can say that it is heavier. And you put one neutron, it becomes two. And then later it, it breaks it down into four, so it's like it geometrically increases. So if you cut down this chain, then you can reduce or stop the chain reaction. So you can use different methods to control there's a chain reaction. So, so the types of nuclear power plant uh, is determined by what methods you use to control neutrons. Uh, next. So I explained about centrifuges and for plutonium, you have to burn uranium. With the centrifuge, you can enrich uranium to like 20% concentration, then you can use it to generate energy. And if it is more than 90% enrichment, it can be used as a weapon. And when you put 
deuterium or tritium, then it can transform into helium. During the process, it creates huge, enormous energy. And in order to combine this deuterium and tritium, you have to create the plasma status, which means ultra high temperature. In order to create this ultra high temperature to um, enable this fusion, you have to use nuclear fission. So you create for energy first through nuclear fission, and with that energy, you combine or fusion deuterium and tritium. So when you hear North Korea developed a hydrogen bomb, we have to interpret the news saying that North Korea developed both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion bombs. Because in order to have a hydrogen bomb, you have to first do nuclear fission. And you have to um, have repeated reflection or repeated nuclear fusion in order to have a hydrogen bomb. I heard that only one to two percent of nuclear materials are enough to make a hydrogen bomb because by reflecting themselves repeatedly, you can have enormous energy with this small amount of nuclear materials. That's why a hydrogen bomb is more dangerous. So this picture shows the process of fusion. So uh, I'm going to next explain what devices are used to give misinformation about North Korea's nuclear information. You hear a lot about seismic magnitude scales. It is um, determined by Richter scale. And actually the number or the scale is not important at all because once it is a nuclear bomb or a hydrogen bomb, it is just like enormous explosive power. Whether it is the liter one or liter two, liter three, it doesn't make any difference here. So even explosive power does not make the change. It's because we cannot be sure of explosive power correctly because you can assume that there was an experiment, there was a test where this test was conducted, but it is impossible to assume or estimate the explosive power because this estimation should be based on so many um, hypers and assumptions. It cannot be correct. And also, there are so many um, variations. They can change or affect the, the numbers. Depending on the nature of the land, or the hardness of the land, uh, which is used as a conduit to um, transport transfer the earthquake, the number can be varied so significantly, so it is impossible to 
correctly estimate the explosive power from these uh, numbers. What is more important is that whether it is artificial seismic impact or it is natural earthquake. And also it is important to know whether it is possible to control the whole process. So whether a country has control power in every stage of the process is very important. And we can say that North Korea is capable to control the whole process. And maybe by comparing um, different the numbers measured at different places, by comparing these measures, maybe you can um, you can designate where the test was conducted. But that's that's all we can say from this measurement. So this shows artificial seismic wave. It, natural earthquake shows kind of like smooth line, but artificial seismic wave shows this rapid changes. And by comparing these measures, we can predict where the test place was. Except that we can just disregard every other assumptions or conclusions from these numbers. Almost nobody knew whether it was a nuclear test before North Korea announced that it conducted a nuclear test. So it means that no intelligence helped the world to understand North Korea's nuclear capability. North Korea officially announced it tested six times. That's the official number. No one knows whether North Korea conducted more than six times of nuclear tests. So during the Kim Dae-jung administration, North Korea conducted a few tests to um, artificially ex make an explosion. It is doubtful whether intelligence knew about this test during that time. Anyway, North Korea has conducted its nuclear test almost every three years. So until the first nuclear test, it conducted like every three years, and then it escalated at the interval of the, its nuclear test. And then later, North Korea announced that it conducted a hydrogen bomb test. It was first revealed in 2016. The fact that North Korea conducted a hydrogen bomb test in January 2016, it means that North Korea already completed its nuclear fission bomb test. And maybe now North Korea has the capability of creating EMP bombs. North Korea also has the capability of subcritical experiments. It means that immediately before chain reaction, you can destroy or eliminate neutrons 
때문에 전혀 And there is no explosion taking place. So no one can know from outside whether there was a nuclear test or not. And it means that if with this capability, you don't have to conduct actual nuclear test because you can stop right before the explosion. In order to do this type of experiment, you have to have a supercomputer. And the fact that North Korea conducted this subcritical experiment means that North Korea has a supercomputer. So it shows that North Korea is capable of nuclear tests comparable to those countries of the United Nations Security Council member states. And North Korea also conducted a unitary management system. So it shows that North Korea completed as a nuclear power. And last time I explained about the secrets of 2008. At that time, North Korea announced that it had the capability of nuclear materials extracted like 39 kilograms. So that was the maximum of extraction. And North Korea also said that it used only two kilograms to make a nuclear warhead. So that was the minimum usage. And that means that um, North Korea has maximum uh, remained nuclear materials. This graph shows an estimate organized by international NGO in 1995. It was the, the numbers organized in 1995, and we already like 25 years passed since the report came out. So we can see that there is even more advancement in its nuclear program. And in order to have a warhead, you have to first reprocess the spent fuel. And it is reported that North Korea has 90 to 120 kilograms of plutonium extracted already, and it used only two kilograms to make one warhead. It means the number of warhead possessed by North Korea could be um, either 45 to 60 units or 90 to 120 units by how many how many plutoniums it used to make one warhead. In terms of highly enriched uranium. The maximum number of warhead it created from highly enriched uranium could be 208 units. And these numbers are not correctly understood or accepted by international scholars. North Korea, North Korea actually like, um, developed its nuclear power in order to protect itself, defend itself from the United States nuclear power, nuclear threat. So it is ridiculous to say that we have to be afraid of North Korea's nuclear threat and we have to equip ourselves with a nuclear threat in order to prevent North Korea's nuclear threat. It's just a vicious cycle here. 
More importantly, North Korea also has a laser method in enriching uranium. It takes only four days to make 20 kilograms of highly enriched uranium by using a laser method. And the methods of verification, I don't understand how we can verify because if something is lower than critical mass, no one else from outside can verify whether there is enriched uranium or not. You may heard a radiocarbon dating method because it takes fixed time to uh, help life of a material. So you can estimate the age of a material by measuring the initial amount and the final amount of a material. But the problem is that North Korea has repeatedly conducted tests or activities in the same place over and over. So it is almost impossible to read past history here. So I understand uh, how it can be created, but I don't know um, further sophisticated methods. But, but anyway, that's, that just shows that it is almost impossible to verify North Korea's nuclear capability through this kind of methods. Anyway, I'm going to um, explain now about history of mechanics and metal technology. There was an almost no legacy of the Japanese empire in terms of the machines industry. And that is why North Korea put a lot of efforts in preserving its machines. If you see or uh, wartime um, records or videos from wartime, like you can see many scenes that um, people hiding machines, like a burying machines in the ground or carrying machines. It is because once machines were destroyed, there was no way to repair them. And that's why uh, North Korea uh, concentrated its efforts and time to develop its machine tools. In 1959, there was a campaign called um, Machine Tools Breeding Campaign because North Korea had fewer machine tools. It was very difficult to mass produce machines and parts. That's why North Korea tried to first create more machine tools to have um, quantitative growth in machine, machine tools. So it's just like breeding machine tools. And in 1985, the second machine tool breeding campaign was conducted. For the first campaign, many people criticized that uh, it is so low quality, so it is was meaningless. But through the 1985, the second campaign, North Korea achieved its qualitative growth and it even made it possible like enlargement, automation, and robotization. And it also has the capability of CNC and unmanned machine production system. And in 1995, 
uh, Kim Jong-il made a visit to, to um, CNC facility, and it is named as Lyonha machines. After the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc collapsed, this technology is was integrated into the missile technology because super precision machines were required to make missiles. About the origins of North Korea's missile technology, there are three theories. First, after the Cuba missile crisis in 1962, North Korea realized that it cannot, it could not depend on the protection provided by the Soviet Union. So North Korea decided to independently develop its missile technology. In the wake of the 1962 Cuban missile crisis, the second theory is that North Korea received the Scud missiles as a reward of its providing support to the Middle East conflicts in the 1970s. And based on this initial input of Scud missiles, North Korea developed its own missile technologies. The third theory is that after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, scientists and engineers from the Soviet Union took refuge in North Korea and from them, North Korea learned its missile technology, but I don't have any document supporting this theory. So regarding super precision machinery, North Korea is capable of this 0.1 micro um, jet engine technology. And it also has fewer technology, which is small in size, safer, and has a huge, great, a huge um, driving power. And also, North Korea is capable of creating warhead. And North Korea has the capability of telecommunication engineering like remote control of rapidly moving objects. And at the same time, a missile should make a judgment rapidly. According to the changing um, environment. And now turn to space industry. People say that like, we are entering into the world of new space error. According to the NASA information, um, North Korea is pursuing this kind of technology. And you see that the market size of the space industry can be like $300 trillion in 2016. And CNC, I'm going to further discuss this issue in my next lecture. CNC can also create highly additive value industries as well as weapons development. So next lecture would be focused on CNC technology. So I'm going to skip that issue today and 
be let's see more about timeline of space vehicles test launching. In 1993, it launched a missile range of more than 1,000 kilometers. After that, in, in 1994, there was a great framework signed. So immediately after North Korea's missile launch test, the United States agreed to negotiate and sign the agreement, maybe for the fear of North Korea's missile technology. And in 1998, North Korea launched its UNHAR-1 satellite. After that, the United States and North Korea signed a joint communique. During the Clinton administration, uh, Jo no, the vice uh, defense minister of North Korea, visited President Clinton at the Oval Office in 1999, and Mr. Jo Myung no was wearing his, his military uniform. And in 2006, North Korea made test launch of Hepodong second. And that's when the United States gave up its CV policy and changed its policy into CC. And then in 2009, 2012, North Korea repeatedly launched its missile test but the United States was not able to react. And that's why it was not able to stop North Korea's repeated missile test. So this graph shows that there is increasing threats, military threats, and there was no way to stop this threat. And I'm going to explain more about devices to deceive the public regarding the missile information. The first device is questioning the range. In 1998, North Korea launched a satellite, and this satellite made a few circles of the Earth. It means that it has had enough range by showing that it could circle its, its satellite over the Earth. And next question is a high angle issue. With a higher angle, it is more difficult to have safe re-entry into the atmosphere. So it is ridiculous to say that a higher angle launch is easier. It is so ridiculous. The fact that North Korea launched its missile at a higher angle means that North Korea tested its capability in the extreme condition. And regarding the engine power, it means that North Korea was capable of controlling the mass of the warhead, including the amount of fuel necessary to launch the missile. And in order to have a safe re-entry into the atmosphere, there should be enough technology to protect the warhead from um, destruction. It needs um, sophisticated remote um, 
pretty much control technology and also had to maintain its inner temperature to 25 to 45 degrees. So, I don't think North Korea has has announced as the most advanced weapons. And another misinformation about North Korea's weapons production system is that like many people say that there is the only single organization producing weapons, but it is not true. There are at least two organizations including the military um, ministry, mili military or engineering ministry and defense science academy. So I think there are more than five agencies or organizations commissioned to develop weapons in North Korea. So I wrote a column refuting those allegations that there is only one organization producing weapons in North Korea. And after my column was revealed, um, there is like no more um, such allegations. So I think I contributed to that somewhat. And let's see some pictures. This picture shows an engine. You test this engine on the land. And this one was taken picture in 2016. So you see this warhead. You have to test whether this warhead can be safely protected after being exposed to ultra high temperature. And after launching Hwasong 12, North Korea announced that it was able to communicate with the warhead after re-entry into the atmosphere. So it shows that the warhead was uh, protected from ultra high temperature. And regarding the angle of re-entry to the atmosphere, you have to um, cut down the energy, like outer energy, from penetrating into the inner space. If it is too low, the angle, then it will be bounced back to out. And if it is too high angle, then it will be break down. It will be broken down and it will be burned down. So if you integrate this re-entry technology into an ICBM, then it means you can control the target range of an ICBM. And if you see this picture, you see that like, there is like empty space between the launcher and the missile. And very small pillars, like tiny pillars are supporting this launcher. And you see that there is a space between those pillars. So it has only like eight pillars supporting this missile. And then immediately before launching the missile, the truck, the, the launcher, just leave the site. It means that with this tiny equipment, tiny device, it can resist the impact of launching a missile. It means that like, this material is ultra hard. So that like, with only four to five pillars, you can support this heavy missile. So that is 
surprising. And this picture shows that um, these missiles were launched with the launcher remaining on the site. It is dangerous to have the launcher remaining in the privity of the missile. It is because there should be enough support power to prevent this missile from shaking away. And then later, North Korea did not maintain this launcher in the vicinity of the missile. It means that North Korea was capable of maintaining the impact without the launcher. And this one is SLBM. Under the surface, there is a submarine. And this, all SLBM should be launched at a diagonal, diagonal um, angle because if it fails, then it would fall down to the submarine and destroy the submarine. That's why it usually the SLBM launch is conducted at a diagonal angle. But then North Korea conducted its SLBM test with vertical angle. That was so amazing. And and you see these pictures showing that it has a repeated explosion to um, have the drive in power. So you see this spike, the fire, but it does not change the anger or attraction of the missile. It maintains its posture, its direction. That is amazing. From that scene, we can see that a missile can maintain its posture stable there are only five countries who can do that, and North Korea is one of them. And this one, people said that like North Korea is preparing to preparing this missile to attack South Korea, but no, it would not use this kind of weapons against South Korea. And next, if you see the wheels, the axis, so after seven wheels, seven axis, North Korea calls it as ICBM, and no one questions the technology. And this one was revealed in 2017, the warhead looks taller than Kim Jong-un. And the most surprising thing is that North Korea was capable of flying two missiles in parallel. So it maintained its finite, sophisticated control of four missiles at the same time, simultaneously. It was so amazing, so surprising. That's why whenever North Korea does conduct any missile test, Hawaii is on a lot. 
and so you can see it in front of the pictures uh, the missile test and you see the different shapes of fire generated from the engine so the different shape shows that it has different methods of making and um, running the engine. And now you see this eight axis launcher and North Korea also launched a missile uh, with a range of about 15,000 kilometers. And it is not possible, like not available to um, estimate or calculate the uh, relations between the axis, the number of axes and the angles and the ranges. But you see this Hwasong 16, it has 11 axes. By um, Rolabusam, it is said that this can this, this can fly uh, more than twelve thousand kilometers. And you see this uh, song three, and that's the history record, history of the video archive. And you see that Kim Jong Un was thinner, so it shows that it was like a few years before. And then, even then, North Korea had Pukuk Sang 3. And it is said that North Korea has Pukuk Sang 4 and 5 types. The conclusion is that combined all this information together, we can see that North Korea made success in developing its nuclear power. But then why we think North Korea failed its nuclear power? It's because of Zener's paradox. So this shows that like, when Hercules reached the point where a turtle was, during the time a turtle moved forward even a little bit. So if we repeat this process again, over and over, then there is no way for Hercules to catch up the turtle. So, but the problem is that like, you can uh, divide infinitely, but the final number or the added up number of infinite intervals can be finite number because time is finite when added up. So even though it seemed that North Korea was not able to have a nuclear power, like it repeatedly failed infinitely even, but still when added up this infinite intervals, infinite failures, North Korea was could have succeeded at the end. So the process of completion of a nuclear force, it started from nothing and there was a possibility there were like activities showing that North Korea maybe had possibility for nuclear force. And then it, the, those activities stopped. And later, the Korea showed experiments and then later tests. And now, 
it already completed its nuclear force. When you see only part of this entire graph, you don't understand it. You don't see the whole picture, but you have to see the whole picture that by repeating the process of activities doing nothing, activities doing nothing, and now North Korea is in the state of nuclear power. That's the conclusion. North Korea does not need any recognition by other countries. North Korea, in fact, is a nuclear state. It independently developed all the technologies, all the skills to control the entire process of missile and nuclear power. And as I explained before, just because North Korea has certain uh, military power, uh, can we overcome North Korea, like fight over North Korea with the same military force? In, when it comes to nuclear power, it is not possible to win over a nuclear state with the nuclear weapons. So if you are too much um, concentrated only on denuclearization or the weapons, you cannot create peace. We are losing the space or opportunities to create a creative peace simply because we are too much overwhelmed by the discussion about weapons. Even with the existence of weapons, we have to increase the level of entanglement among different parties so that any act of one party can have a significant impact to other parties so that every party should be eager to prevent a war. And North Korea has nothing to lose right now without no entanglement involved in the relationship. And the United States would have the same argument. So that's why we have to increase the entanglement level between the parties so that we can prevent a war. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him big hands. And I would like to also appreciate all of the attendees. Thank you so much for your participation and thank you so much for your lecture, Dr. Kang. And thank you for the interpretation because I speak fast and it is all about difficult scientific matters. And next, we will have three questions and answers. So let's stop here my lecture. And now we will go into free question and answer, free discussion. If we have any questions, please freely ask questions. And we also have some questions on the chatting. One of the council advisors has a question. Would you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Hi, my name is Michael Moon. Many of your lectures are really like unbelievable. Many people think North Korea is kind of like a mafia, international mafia. As you explained, it seems that North Korea has 
advanced technology comparable to advanced countries. But you say that like, it is really possible. Like, it is... So are you are you asking that North Korea actually conducted such tests or I mean I, I doubt whether North Korea can really target precisely. <laughs> I, I explained that North Korea is capable of. So you was were you surprised of knowing that? Yes. So I'm saying that like North Korea went beyond the possibility experiments has, and now North Korea has the capability. So everybody saw that. So no one doubts or no one questions the. The Missile technology is very advanced technology. If North Korea is capable of having this missile technology, it means that North Korea has advanced science and technology level. Yes, that's correct. North Korea was even earlier in creating its academy of science and, and developed many advanced machines before South Korea. Like North Korea was able was able to make a a motor for a car early in the 1960s. According to my understanding, there should be multiple measures which can be launched from different places for different targets at the same time. That's only, only then the country can be said um, having the weapons system. When it comes to a nuclear weapon, you we need precise control. Even one hydrogen bomb, bomb can destroy the half of the Earth. So even one hydrogen bomb is enough to say that North Korea is capable of a nuclear force. And then when North Korea demonstrated that it has at least one hydrogen bomb, people said that like, oh no, you need like more than 100 bombs to say that you are capable of a nuclear force, but that's ridiculous. As, as I explained, why North Korea conducted more than six times of nuclear tests until North Korea announced that it conducted its test and nobody knew that. That's why 
I mean, I could so like, no one knows where North Korea maintains its nuclear weapons and how many nuclear warheads it has. So like, it's just like a cockroach. If you see one cockroach at your home, it means that there can be hundreds and thousands of cockroaches living in your house. So, there was a the compromise made among the parties in 2009 that I could say North Korea was capable of this amount of activities, this level of activities. And that was the compromise made in 2009. YouTube 참고하시면 됩니다. 어 그다음 오용섭 선생님 질문해 주세요. Next. 예, 박사님. Mr. 오용섭. 네, 안녕하세요. It's great to see you. 세종입니다. 세종. I am connecting from Sejong, South Korea. Thank you for your lecture. So now I think everyone understands that North Korea has a nuclear force, but why now North Korean people are suffering like economic difficulties? Everybody knows that so North Korea may have to use its nuclear power at an bargaining card to improve its economic situations. What do you think? No, I don't think that is a possibility. I don't think there is a possibility that North Korea will trade its nuclear weapons with others. And we have no information about the budget of making a nuclear bomb. The only available information is how much it the United States has spent um, to create two nuclear atomic bombs in 1945. Under the Manhattan Project, and the majority of the budget was spent on building the facilities. And we already know that North Korea has this Yongbyon facility. And North Korea already promised that. Okay, we would not do anything with the Yangbyon facility. So another way to solve this issue is that encouraging North Korea to use the, its nuclear capability, to nuclear power for peaceful use. And that would be the main topic of my third lecture. I'm not sure um, what you mean by saying that North Korea has difficulties in self-reliance. There are conflicting information coming from North Korea that uh, North Korea is again regaining its economic stability. So I think it is it is far from the first uh, collapse. Thank you so much for your lecture. It was very helpful. And I again realized that I didn't know North Korea. <laughs> so, I, I am so curious about everything. During the Second World War, I remember 
because of uh, my curiosity about the atomic bombs um, during the Second World War, I even made a few visits to the places where it was said these atomic bombs were hidden. And are you in Japan now? I think one of the reasons why we don't know about North Korea very much is because of those people who try to maintain the status quo, the division, and and subjected to the United States and Japan. I am saying that the territory of the Republic of Korea contains the Korean Peninsula and its island. So I am so regretful that I had no chance to visit North Korea. Uh, encourage Jamun Yuan-nim to ask Next, Mr. Kim Yong-han from Encourage. Yeah, unmute to ask you. Please unmute uh, yourself. Uh, yeah, 지난, 지난 Hello, everyone. <laughs> I was here last month. I was here last month. I was here last month. 기후 변화 쪽으로 하고 있어요 알라스카. 아, 예. 예. 그런데 이제 제가 I'm 학사 working. 석사 때 이제 전공이 다르다 보니까 방사능 and 쪽으로 계속 해 왔거든요. 내추럴 뉴클라이드 쪽으로 해 가지고 저는 과학적인 연구를 해 왔는데 상당히 I also studied the science. 어 말씀의 주제는 조금 전에 이 앞에 분 말씀하신 거는 대포동 일본의 대포동 수사 때 미군 기지가 그 미사와 기지에서 그걸 봐가지고 일본이 uh, 난리 난 거로 저는 알고 있거든요. I understand that yeah, yeah, yeah. in 1998 when yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 대포동 yeah, 제가 제가 was launched, 거는, 그동안에 저희들이 it was a term from the US base in Japan and that shocked the United States. And you explained that uh, the Japanese government did not expect to 사실은 지금 문재인 대통령이나 바이든 정부에서도 비핵화를 주장하고 있지 않습니까? 지금까지. 그런데 지금 결론하고는 완대 반대 개념이거든요. 왜 지금 정부는 문재인 정부가 비핵화에 목숨을 걸고 있는지. 그래야만 하는. I wonder whether the government is also. 왜냐 그럼 이렇게 사실로 나와가 있는데. 똑같이 이야기하자면 너가 창을 갖고 대포를 갖고 있으면 나도 가지고 있으면 똑같다는 개념이거든요. 그런데 지금 말씀을 들어보니까 우리 핵을 가지고 있다더라도 우리가 핵을 가질 이유가 없지는 않지 않습니까? 안전을 위해서. 네. 그래서 it doesn't make sense. North Korea is saying that for the safety of its future, it should have nuclear power. But I'm not sure if you can achieve safety through nuclear power. I don't know. Like, I'm thinking that maybe it would be better for South Korea to have nuclear power. What changes, what positive changes, what positive changes can we give to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think that we are, we are subjected to the influence of China? 
죄송하지만 제가 한번 음 뮤트를 시켜 볼게요. 김용원 교수님을 뮤트 만... 시키니까 음성이 <웃음> 뭔가 없어졌... 방송이 꼬였습니다. 두 개가 동시에 나오고 있습니다. 아, 예. 그럼 어, 뭐 질문 질문인지는 모르겠는데 핵을 네. 가지는 거하고 I'm not sure if it, um, I got the question correctly, but I think whether we have nuclear power or not doesn't make any change. Because if you don't have the capability of the entire process, like creating nuclear power and operating nuclear power, if not, we have to import nuclear power, nuclear weapons outside. And it, it doesn't mean that we actually have a nuclear power because we cannot afford the nuclear weapons if we don't have the technology. And if it, and we don't have the um, the capability to bear the pressure. But North Korea has the capability because it independently developed its nuclear power. So we have to understand the North Korea's nuclear weapons system with the same logics. So people say that the aim of um, of North Korean strategy is that like, to prevent its nuclear weapons. But what if there is next level of a weapons system beyond the nuclear system? Then are you going to say that like, our aim is to prevent this X level of a weapons system? No, we have to create an environment where such a such a weapons system. Is not necessary. So, in order to control North Korea's nuclear weapons program, the only way is to build build cameras to monitor the activities at the nuclear facilities and send. Um, inspection. Send investigators to the facilities. I, I hope you can continue your discussion through the Telegram group. So I will go to the next question. Mr. Nokinam. If you are not here with us, I'm going to read his question. He said that it is important to increase entanglement in order to prevent or solve the nuclear issues. But I used the term entanglement because I thought that engagement is too weak to, to be a solution. Because I think like we should go beyond the engagement to entanglement. The more exchanges, the less possibility of a war breaking out. For example, like liaison offices, if we have more liaison offices functioning well, then it will prevent a war from taking place. 
Some people say that um, the United States troops stationed in South Korea is kind of like a hostage, making the United States automatically intervening into a world. That's kind of entanglement. So when things are interconnected more closely, then you have to think, consider the impact of each other's activity that will prevent us from facing our world. Next. My name is Rigu from Seattle. Thank you for your lecture. I'm not sure if I understood your lecture correctly. Uh, you explained that North Korea's nuclear program um, advanced from nuclear fission to nuclear fusion and EMP bombs. So you think the ultimate goal or ultimate level of North Korea's nuclear power is EMP bombs? The reason why I ask this question is that I, I remember that the Trump administration issued an executive order to prevent uh, EMP bombs. And North Korea could be contained in this executive order. But North Korea never officially announced that it is going to use EMP bombs, but everybody knows that there is EMP bomb available in a future world. Like every um, online games that children are playing speak of an EMP bomb because it can nullify electric devices with EMP electric wave. And that is the most effective and efficient way to um, nullify the enemy power. But it, it requires very sophisticated, precise control. But I think North Korea is capable of EMP bombs. There is no information available supporting this, um, this allegation, but North Korea has a, a hydrogen bomb. With that level of technology, I'm, I think North Korea must have the capability of creating EMP bombs. And EMP bombs are safer because it does not have radiation fallout. And there is no reason for North Korea not to develop EMP bombs if it has the technology. Thank you for your lecture and thank you for the discussions. And this will close the second lecture of the full series lectures. Thank you, Dr. Kang, for your lecture and thank you for the patience and listening of all the participants. So next lecture will be focused on civilian use of nuclear power in North Korea. The webinar will be held on June 5th, the same time. I hope our efforts can contribute to the unification of the Korea. Thank you, everyone. あ、そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そうだね。そう
보기 이렇게 했더니 이렇게까지 음, 어, 높은 줄 몰랐습니다. 아니 물론 어, 예 왜냐하면은 핵 포기 핵 포기 이게 절대 안 된다 그 정도는 어, 이해는 했지만은 오늘 이렇게 들으니까 이런, 이런 입장에서는 핵 포기를 못 하는 거죠. 왜냐하면은 어쨌든 간에 와 이렇게 발전된 몰랐어요. 많이 배웠어요. 예, 네, 고맙습니다. 예, 예. 좀 어, 어, 어려운데. 그 그렇죠. 네. 아주 어렵습니다. 한번더 보십시오. 예. 아, 가셨나요? 아, 예, 아니 갑자기 다들 뮤트가 되셨네요. 예, 다시 업뮤트를 푸셔도 됩니다. 기술적인 좀 약간 어, 작동인 것 같습니다. 예. 잡음이 많이 나오면 예, 업뮤트로 해주시고요. 예, 누군가가 잡음이 있어서 아마 업뮤트가 된것 같습니다. 마이클 윤생님 충격에서 예. 좀 벗어나셨습니까? <웃음> 아니 솔직히 인정 안 했는데 솔직히, 솔직히. 예? 북한이 지금 대단한 나라가 세상에서 지금 그러니까 쿠바 같은 경우도 오 잘해보자 잘해보자 하잖아요 지금 이제는 미국하고 그렇죠? 근데 세상에서 유일하게 미국을 상대로 가운데서 그라 들어올리면서 쌍욕을 할수 있는 나라가 주, 북한 아닙니까 그 기계가 <웃음> 정말 그러고도 기계가. 나, 나라가 안 망해요 그러고도 안 망해 나라가 그러니까 정말 대단한 나라 같아요 진짜 미스터리죠 근데, 네, 근데 문제는 뭐냐면 은 저렇게 영원히 갈, 갈 거냐는 거죠 언제까지 갈 건데 니들은 도대체 계속 간다는 얘기죠. 계속 가는 네? 가는 절기 다 세워졌다고 이제 발표를 네. 했죠. 